In this video, I'm going to start chapter three, uh, which is called uh, factors market, or I like to call it input market. And here is the main idea. In chapter one and two, we considered the monopoly problem and the monopoly problem is the seller, the unique seller in the output market. So it's a seller in the output market. Um, however, uh, the firm, uh, whether it's monopolist or not, should be also operating in the input market. In order to produce something, you should be first buying some inputs, use that through your technology production, and then produce the output and sell it, right? So each firm actually operates not only in the output market, but also in the input market. And so if you're a monopolist in the output market, that behavior will sort of influence the firm's uh, optimal choices uh, in the input market as well, right? So in this chapter, for that reason, we are also include um, the input market into our analysis, all right? So in chapter one, we considered the standard monopoly problem. In chapter two, we said, let's relax the assumption and the assumption that the monopolist should charge the same price across all the customers uniform pricing and see what happens if the monopolist um, enjoys a different strategy such as first, second and third degree price discrimination. In chapter three, we say, oh, you know what? Focusing only on output market is not enough because the monopolist as a whole operates in both input and output market. So then let's consider the, the, the firm's uh, sort of choice behavior and, and action in both of those markets. So. For that reason, we're bringing the input market into the picture and construct the optimization problem uh, accordingly and then compare how the firm's behavior would change uh, in comparison to the perfectly competitive firm. All right, so for that reason, we need uh, several assumptions, the modeling assumptions throughout this chapter that we're going to uh, 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 sort of uh, assume. Well, the first assumption, oh, first off, we have an input market or factors market again, and then output markets, all right? So these are, once again, the model specific assumptions. Um, for each question, we may have different uh, question specific assumptions. All right, so in the input markets, obviously, uh, for example, in um, uh, intermediate microeconomics one, we uh, considered uh, two variables, right? The labor and capital, two standard inputs. Um, I know uh, usually the firms uh, use more than one input, but for simplicity, we're going to assume that there is only one input. Most of the times we're gonna call it as labor. And then in the output market, there's going to be again, one output. So the in a sense, uh, the firm uses labor as an input and then produces some output and sells it in the output market. All right, so that's the idea. Well, in the output market, the firm, all right, so the firm is a seller, right? And in the input market, the firm is a buyer. Obviously, there might be a bunch of different and complicated scenarios where the, the firm actually produces several outputs. And so it's several in some input markets and then buyer in, in, in some input markets. So you may kind of think of uh, way complicated scenarios, but let's simplify everything. So the firm that we're gonna be considering is gonna be a buyer in the input market and then the seller in the output market. All right, so because uh, the firm is a seller in the output market, we assume that the, the, the demand side is given. So we, we didn't want to analyze the demand side. We just wanted to analyze the firm's behavior. So therefore we took the demand as given. Remember, demand is given by a downward sloping demand curve. And we usually used uh, the inverse demand curve for that purpose. So Q is the quantity, P is the market price. So, and demand is given, it's a downward sloping curve. And then in the input market, because the firm is a buyer, uh, we will assume that the supply is given, given in the sense that we do not 
uh, think about, oh, what the supply is or how to find the optimal supply. We're not going to ask those questions. So we are going to take the supply of that market as given. All right. So supply of the input, say labor, is given. And again, uh, I'm going to stick to the, uh, the la uh, labor uh, market as the input market. I'm going to denote it by W. All right. And I'm going to use X as the notation for input. All right. So X or sometimes in some questions we use L. All right. So these are uh, the quantity of input. All right. X or L. And W is the price of that input, um, so to speak, it's the wage, all right? And again, here it's the quantity because it's standard, I didn't write it, the P is the price. So the supply curve uh, here, we assume that it's upward sloping, so it's an increasing function of X. So the more labor you would like to hire, the higher wage you should be paying, all right? So that's the idea. Um, well. Obviously, there's a cost, right? Uh, there's cost, but the cost is, we assume, incurred by the uh, sort of uh, buying the input. So the cost is, therefore, W or the price of um, labor times the amount of labor you use, W times X. So we don't have any cost in the output market in that sense. We have only one cost. And so remember the cost of quantity, right? So here the cost of quantity is actually determ determined by the cost of labor. All right. Well, what else? Well, we have a production function uh, or technology. I, I put it in the input market. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a function that maps the output into input. So here, again, a notation. I'm going to use Y um, or, or Q as the, as the quantity of output, quantity of output. So in that sense, it may be denoted by P of Q or P of Y sometimes. All right. So don't be surprised with the notation Y. So Y, Q, I'm going to use them interchangeably. And X or L, I'm going to use them interchangeably. Most of the times, I, I think I'm going to stick to X here and as, as an output Y there. Um, and so there's a, there's a transformation. It's like how much X will be transformed into uh, how much Y. And that's determined by Y equals F of X. All right, so we call it production function. Production function. And if you remember the derivative of the production function, all right, or del F del X, we call it marginal productivity. Remember, marginal productivity. Usually, the, the productivity is an increasing function. The more input you use, the more output you get. Uh, but then um, its, it's, it's derivative uh, is, is decreasing, so it's a concave function. So the more input you uh, use increases your output, but the rate at which your output increases decreases. So it's a concave fashion. Uh, makes sense. Because um, you know, the, uh, so it, the, we usually assume either a constant returns to scale or decreasing returns to scale, uh, because the technology, an increasing returns to scale technology is like, as far as I know, a non-existent. Okay. So the input market, once again, let's repeat. Uh, there's one input for simplicity, one output in the output market. The buyer, the firm is the buyer in the input market, the seller in the output market, um, because of this, uh, the supply curve is given in the input market, so it's some increasing function of the input. And in the output market, the demand curve is given, which is a decreasing function of quantity, which is denoted either by Q or Y. The cost associated with the amount of input you use is just the, um, you know, the price per input times the quantity. And then how much output you can produce with the amount of input you, you, you buy is, is, is this uh, 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 function F, which is sometimes called production function, sometimes called technology. All right. Um, it basically maps inputs into outputs. All right. So what else? 
Um, well, obviously we need to know the structure of the input market and the structure in the output market. Uh, so we're going to analyze three cases, all right? So case one, uh, not in this video, but in the um, follow-up videos. So case one is uh, both markets are competitive, perfectly competitive, all right? Competitive, which means the firm is price taker in both firms. Perfectly competitive, I'm sorry. Competitive. So the wage is some fixed number, W, and the, uh, the input price, P, is a constant number because the firm, all right, is perfectly competitive, uh, 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 just one firm in a perfectly competitive labor market in a, and in a perfectly competitive output market. Uh, this case we analyze as a benchmark uh, model or benchmark outcome and then we make the comparison well what if the firm is monopolist or monopsonist and how the output choices differ uh, in comparison to the perfectly competitive market for that reason. So this is a benchmark result, case one. The interesting cases, case two and three, um, in case two we're going to assume the firm is perfectly competitive, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the input market is perfectly competitive, all right? Um, and then the firm is gonna take the wage as given. The firm cannot change the wage. And then the firm is monopolist in the outcome market, which is kind of our standard case, right? The firm is monopolist in the output market, but we, we, we ignore the input market. Now, case two, we will actually going to take into consideration the input market and then sort of uh, consider this whole scenario. So you can think of this as like, uh, the firm is producing a high-tech gadget um, and it's the only producer, it's the only seller, so it's monopolist. However, it hires the laborers, the inputs, from the markets where there are a bunch of other sellers, um, other producers, and so they also hire labor from this market. So when it comes to input, the firm is, you know, perfectly competitive, but when it comes to output, it's monopolist. All right, so that's the case we're gonna analyze. So those cases are important because their profit functions are different. And here it takes the price of income fixed, and here it sets the price, all right? So the variables will change, and hence the outcomes. And then the final case that we're going to consider, case three, is that it's the only firm in the input market, and we don't call it monopoly, we call it monopsony. So the unique buyer, all right? Only buyer. That's the definition of, oops, monopsony, and then perfectly competitive, perfectly competitive in the outcome uh, markets, competitive. So think of this as um, <clears throat> the firm is the only uh, big uh, factory in, 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 a, in a local, in, in, a, in a small town. It's the only um, uh, a place where the people can actually work, well, let's suppose. So in that sense, it is the only buyer uh, in, the, in the labor market. And, and the, the, this, this firm produces yogurt, let's say. And in a grocery store, there are a bunch of different labels and different uh, yogurts. And because those, you know, the, you know, there are a bunch of other yogurt producers throughout the country. And so they ship their products into this small town. So in, in, in terms of output, the firm is perfectly competitive. But in terms of uh, input, the firm is monopsonist. So then the question is, how does this firm's behavior will influence the total output level, total uh, input level, and total wage, I'm sorry, the optimal wage level, and so on and so forth. Um, finally, I mean, you may kind of say, well, there is also case four, which is the firm is monopsonist in the input market and the monopolist in the output market. Yes, sure, of course, that is possible. Um, I may give the optimization problem of this uh, firm, but we're not going to solve this, uh, partly because it's not that interesting. 
and our textbook doesn't really cover that. So the case two and three are the core for this chapter. So once you understand these two cases, I think you're done. Obviously case one is important because it's the benchmark result. So those three cases are the key uh, to understand in this chapter. All right, so in the next videos, I will cover those three cases, all right?